Welcome everybody uh, to today's presentation on passive building strategies. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is David Pratt. Uh, just a little background about me. Uh, I'm a professional engineer in the state of Texas. Uh, my discipline is mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm also a certified energy manager and a lead accredited professional in building design and construction. I have a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the University of Michigan and a Master of Science in Engineering Management from the Air Force Institute of Technology. And I have 11 years of experience in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, military construction, and sustainable design. Um, hopefully uh, you can all hear me. If the sound is working okay. Feel free to give me a question uh, if you're having any problems at all. Um, Technical questions I'll try to answer uh, as I get them, but uh, for most questions I'll try to wait till the end to, to answer them all. So here's a little uh, description of what we're going to go over today. Uh, we're going to talk about the history, purpose, characteristics, and benefits of passive buildings. Then we're going to go a little bit into uh, different uh, design strategies for passive buildings. And then the lead applicability uh, for some of these different strategies, what credits uh, you may be able to attain using these strategies. And then finally, uh, a couple case studies on a residential and a commercial building uh, that use passive building strat strategies fairly heavily. So the main purpose of passive buildings, um, I, I guess the uh, a basic definition is to condition the heat and cool a building uh, with little to no use of mechanical or electrical systems. And the, the reasons for doing this is energy conservation, uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, cost savings, both initial and recurring, uh, and then maintenance avoidance. Uh, so why is this important to us? Well, buildings consume more energy than any other sector. Uh, every year, nearly 40% of all the energy produced in the U.S. is consumed by the building sector, uh, about the same amount of energy consumed by both transportation and industry combined. Of, that electri uh, of the electricity consumed, over three-quarters of it goes to operate the buildings that we live and work in. And by comparison, industry uses about 24% and transportation less than 1%. Uh, the building sector energy consumption is expected to grow. Fossil fuels supply 84% of the total U.S. and 76% of the building sector energy consumption. And it's the burning of these fossil fuels to generate energy that results in the production of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that are now fueling uh, the dangerous climate change that we hear about so often. Uh, the building sector is the largest contributor to the United States uh, carbon dioxide emissions. According to uh, the Energy Information Administration, nearly 39% of all CO2 emissions in 2009 came from the building sector. And by comparison, uh, transportation accounted for about 33% and industry uh, just 20%. 80% of all U.S. electricity uh, carbon dioxide emissions come from coal. Coal and, and other fossil fuels uh, are basically the, it's the only fossil fuel that's uh, plentiful enough to contribute the amount of carbon dioxide necessary to trigger irrever irreversible climate change. Uh, the U.S. Is, or the world is currently at 392 parts per million and is increasing approximately 2 ppm annually. Scientists warn that irreversible climate change will occur at 450 parts per million um, or really any level much above 350 parts per million, as long as that's sustained for, for a long period of time. So 350 is what we're aiming at, and we need to go down. Climate change is really an energy problem, specifically burning of fossil fuels uh, for energy. And uh, there's two sides of this energy issue, both supply and demand. Uh, in order to effectively address the phase out of coal-fired power plants to address this greenhouse gas issue, we have to reduce demand from electricity from these plants. Uh, and we can do that through energy efficient buildings. Since the planet has already experienced some warming and because additional warming due to the inertia of the climate system will occur, 
today's buildings have to be designed uh, to adapt to these changes. Uh, as of 2010, the building stock in the United States was about 275 billion square feet. And by the year 2035, approximately three quarters of the built environment will be either new or renovated. So we're, we're going to have a lot more buildings come online or a lot of buildings be renovated here. And it's a good idea now to start using some of these passive building strategies in order to conserve energy and reduce uh, the greenhouse gases that are contributing to climate change. Um, from an economic standpoint, uh, you can save quite a bit of money by reducing energy through these strategies and reduce a lot of the uh, operations and maintenance headaches that you have with uh, all these uh, very extensive mechanical systems, uh, which is also uh, an additional cost savings. Okay, we, we highlighted on thermal mass a little bit, so let's go a little bit more in depth here. Uh, as we discussed, thermal masses in a building absorb the thermal energy from the outdoor environment during the day and give that energy back when the surroundings are cooler at night. Many thermal mass materials are masonry in nature and have typical thermal conductivity of one inch per hour, as we alluded to earlier. In order to be effective as a thermal mass, a material has to have a high heat capacity, moderate conductance, moderate density, and a high emissivity. And we'll talk a bit, a bit about what each of those are. Passive and energy conserving buildings seeking to manage the available thermal energy by lowering the peaks and filling the valleys of energy usage in order to maintain conditions for human comfort. Thermal mass is, is one tool designers can use to control the temperature. Thermal masses are ideally placed within the building and situated where it can be exposed to low angle winter sunlight via the windows, but insulated from the heat loss. In summer, the same thermal mass should be obscured from a higher angle summer sunlight in order to prevent overheating of the structure in the summertime. The thermal mass is worn passively by the sun or additionally by uh, internal heating systems such as occupants, electronics, appliances, equipment, you know, other things that are in the building during the day. Thermal energy stored in the mass is then released back into the interior during the night. The use of thermal mass is most challenging in an environment where night temperatures remain elevated. A trum wall is a high mass wall typically made of solid concrete or grout filled concrete masonry unit with a glass color. Solar energy absorbs into the wall and heat moves through it to the interior of the space. The glazing minimizes the radiant heat transfer back to the environment. The trum wall has an advantage that energy is delayed and radiated into the space at a later time when the building needs more heat. And as we said, the delay is typically through masonry about an inch per hour of wall thickness. As a caution, the trum wall will add some heat in the summer due to uh, diffuse solar radiation, even with overhangs. And additionally, the insulation of these walls are, are a little low. So to optimize performance, the annual net effect has to be considered when designing a trum wall, including any additional cooling loads. Cooling loads. The trum wall performance can also be diminished by three-dimensional heat transfer to the ground. By thermally decoupling the trom wall footings from the ground with insulation, unnecessary heat loss is avoided and more heat from the trom wall is supplied to the building. Uh, so I have a couple pictures here. You can see what a trom, uh, an example of a trom wall looks like and also an example of, of what a water wall would look like where you get the indirect solar heat gain. Um, some other types of devices that are used for thermal mass, uh, earth and mud has been used quite extensively in the past along with adobe and clay brick. Uh, rammed earth uh, is another type of uh, material that is, is often used. And simple concrete slabs uh, can absorb that energy as well. 